to see you. Good to be with you today. We invite you to turn in your Bible to Philippians, the book of Philippians, the first chapter. We'll start there. And uh, thankful again for this opportunity to come and sing together and pray together and take the <laughs> supper together. And that's in part what I want to talk to you about today is the great privilege that we do have to uh, enjoy fellowship together within the plan of God. Philippians <coughs> chapter 1 and verse 1 begins with these words, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. That's how he begins the letter. Uh, toward the end of the letter in chapter 4 and in verse 15 we find these words. <clears throat> and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. He writes to a church he knows well and he writes in part I think to thank them for what they've done for him and to encourage them. But I want you to notice that when he writes to the saints uh, he's writing to the church and just as a point of passing here the word saint in the Bible is not used like men use it men use the word saint to describe some special class of Christian but you know and I know when you read the Bible that's not the way the word's used saint describes all God's people uh, we're all called to be saints uh, th there's no junior category for a Christian every child of God is called to be sanctified set apart to God so my point is that when you read this letter, it's written to the church, to the saints at Philippi. <clears throat> now, the word church is used in several different ways in the Bible. That's true. Just in passing, you know one way it's not used? It's never used in reference to the building. This is not the church, is it? Never in the scriptures. Now, men use it like that all the time. But never in scripture is the word church used in reference to the structure where a church meets. The church is the people, always. But sometimes the word church is used to describe the called out of God all over the world, even those who've gone on, all of God's people. Um, and uh, we find that, for example, in Matthew 16, 18, when Jesus made this great promise to Peter. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. The rock is not Peter. The rock is the confession Peter made. You are the Christ, the Son of God. That's the rock. That's the foundation. Because Jesus is the Christ. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. He wasn't talking about just a church in Philippi or a church at North Bend, was he? He was talking about all of his people, the church everywhere, God's people everywhere. In Ephesians chapter 3, a great passage that deserves, you know, just a great to, to explore. But just in passing here, we'll make this point. That Paul is describing the marvelous grace of God. And he says that that grace that allows you to be saved, and that includes all of us, anywhere that are saved. He said that shows God's graciousness and his wisdom. He allowed me to explain this mystery. God who created all things kept it hidden in the past. He did this so that now through the church he could let the rulers and authorities in heaven know his infinite wisdom. He's not talking about just some local church somewhere. He's talking about all the same and how God could take me, a sinner and unclean and lost and hopeless and make me his child that shows God's power, his love, his grace. Church is used sometimes in a, in a broad sense. Now, when you talk about the saved, I think Acts gives us a great insight into this. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. This great sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, and he's, for the first time, the gospel is preached in the world, just, as, just after Christ has been raised from the dead and ascended to heaven, and here is Peter in the very place where Christ was crucified here in Jerusalem and he's preaching in the portico of the temple there and he's telling these folks that that same Jesus whom you crucified is Lord and Christ. And they said, what can we do? And he told them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins 
And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how people became saints. That's how they became Christians. They as believers were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins. And then later on in verse 47, these people praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Wherever they are around the world for that matter, all those who in faith that Jesus is the Son of God repent and are baptized into Christ are his people. The church universal, sometimes we call it. The church everywhere. <clears throat> and in this sense, there's only one church. There's only one body of Christ. There's only one people. Uh, that's Ephesians 4.4. 4. Excuse me. There's one body. And that body is the church. Chapter 1 and verse 22 and 23 tells us. So, one church. Now, what we're talking about is a different use of the word church in the Bible. Because the Bible doesn't just use the word to describe all the saved. Sometimes, like our text, he uses it to describe God's people in a particular place. And not just people who happen to be together, but people who have come together to work together. It's used of a local church. You know, the saved, those saints, are not expected just to go on their own. There are people who I think have that concept, that idea that maybe, you know, just me and God, that's all we need. And I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to be his son, his child, and I'm just going to sit over here under a tree and be by myself. Well, that's not really God's plan for us. His plan is that his children in a given area might come together and work together and follow his will and, and fulfill his will. And we can find that local fellowship described as a church in in. in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, we know that the book of Revelation was originally addressed to seven churches in what used to be known as Asia Minor. Uh, Revelation 1 and verse 11, unto Ephesus and Smyrna, to Pergamos and Thyatira, to Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Seven churches. Uh, that's not a surprise to us. Most of the New Testament, not all, but most of them are addressed actually to churches of God's people. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 uh, is uh, likewise addressed. Now it begins, 1 Corinthians begins with the words, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother under the church of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So here are God's people in a city called Corinth, and they come together to work together as the church that belongs to God or the church that belongs to Christ. That's a local church. And we read about the importance of that type of work. Now let's be clear about something. These local churches, in that sense they may be plural, because there's more than one city, more than one place where God's people meet. But they were not different denominations as you see today. In fact, I don't find any Bible authority for different denominations. We'll call ourselves this, we'll call ourselves that, we'll go by this creed, we'll go by that creed. I don't find any such thing in the scripture ever approved of. What I find are God's people, in, in, you're here in Corinthians maybe, if you turn over to the fourth chapter of 1 Corinthians, just flip a page over, and in verse 17, Paul writes to them and tells them uh, that um, this is 4 and verse 17. I'm going to send Timothy to you, I hope, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who will bring you in remembrance of my ways which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Everywhere Paul went with these congregations, he didn't teach a different doctrine. He taught the same doctrine because they were committed to the same creed, and that is the will of God is revealed by the apostles. They differed only in location. And you notice here as we read our text in Philippians, he writes this letter to the Philippians to the church at uh, Philippi, the saints of Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Every work, every congregation had its own leadership. You never read in the Bible about one church over other churches. 
Men commonly do that. That's never been God's plan. Every congregation ruled its own affairs by the will of God. It was, it was intended for each church, sometimes we use these phrases, to be, or these terms, to be independent and autonomous, self-governing. Of course, God's will has to govern us. But every congregation had its own treasury, had its own work, had its own government. That was God's plan for the local church. And joining a local church is important and always has been important. Well, I'm a Christian, isn't that enough? Well, we have to be Christians. That's where it starts. But it's also important in God's plan for us to find others who are committed to the same pure Christianity and to work together wherever we are. In Acts chapter 9, we find one example, and there are several in the Bible, but one example of this. And this is the example of Saul of Tarsus. We all remember him, the number one enemy that Christianity maybe has ever had was Saul of Tarsus. He hated Christians until the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus and he realized that his whole life had been a lie and his whole purpose had been backward. And so he that day was struck with guilt. He went into the city. A man named Ananias came to him and asked him, now he's a believer. Now he believes in Jesus. He saw him. He said, why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And he does that. But then he doesn't just go over here again and sit under a tree by himself. He wants to be joined to others who are disciples of Jesus. And he is at Damascus. That's where he was when he was baptized into Christ. <clears throat> and uh, of course, this is verse 19 of Acts 9. And when he had received meat and was strengthened, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Well, of course, that, where else would he be? And he worked with them for a time and preached the gospel. Everybody was so shocked that this is the guy who's been arresting Christians to put them to death. And now he is one. And then a persecution arose and the brethren thought it best that he leave town. And so he did. And where does he go? He goes 150 miles south to Jerusalem where a congregation also of God's people exists. But uh, in verse 26, when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. He tried, he attempted to do that. He wanted to do that. To join himself to the disciples, to the local church there, to the Christians there. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. By the way, it's sort of hard to blame them. You know, Paul had such a reputation, uh, they thought it might be a trap. But Barnabas, a great man, took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how that he had seen the Lord in the way and how that he had spoken to him and how that he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them in coming in and going out at Jerusalem. He joined himself to the brethren there. I think that's, that's an important part of this whole picture here. That's how church membership, by the way, takes place. It's a very formal arrangement, I think. It has to be so. That people have to decide, first of all, that they wish to be a part of a certain number. There may be other choices. And then once they've made that choice, and it's an important choice to make, which group will I be a part of? Then that church has to recognize whether this person is legitimately a disciple of the Lord. And if they're serving God and committed to serving God. So we have here a, a mutual agreement when it comes to church, local church membership. Here on the one hand is Saul who decides, I want to go to Jerusalem and be a part of that group. They couldn't just draft him against his will, and neither did it happen automatically. The church there had to make a decision about how they saw him and how they understood who he was and what he stood for. I believe that's still true today. Uh, that may not be the way people do it in some places, but I think that's still the, God, the will of God. It's rather haphazard and careless otherwise that local congregations and those who seek their fellowship have to make those decisions and they need to communicate and be clear about those decisions. 
Now, I want to spend our time today uh, exploring the question of why it's so important to be a part of a local church. What do I need that for? After all, I've got my relationship with the Lord, and we do. And if we were somewhere in the world where we were by ourselves, could we not be saved? Yeah, we could. But when it comes to God's arrangement, it's not the best thing for us to be by ourselves. It's the best thing for us to try to be with and work with those of like precious faith. Why I need a local church. Well, let me mention a few reasons that occur to us. In the first place, I need that because I need to share in the collective work that a local church does. Think about that passage we began with in Philippians 4. What was going on there? Here is Paul. He has uh, planted the church at Philippi. He preached the gospel there. He saw those people converted, but he didn't stay. His work was planting churches. So he left, and he said to them, he said, when I left Macedonia, no church, local church, partnered with me in giving and receiving except you only. That is, you were the only church who helped support me as I went to work and preach in other places. But notice the language there. This translation reads that they partnered with him. The old King James says they had fellowship with him. Same idea. They shared in that work. Now, if you were a member at Philippi, wouldn't it please you to know that by your contribution and by the decision of the church to send funds to Paul, that you were in effect partnering with Paul? I'd like to partner with Paul, whatever he's doing. I'd be proud to partner with a fellow like that. Uh, it, would be, it would be a great joy to me. Local churches can do great work. They can share in that work. And all of us, every member, as a part of that, shares in that fellowship, in that partnership. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, beginning in verse 1, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come. Let me pause to say, people might ask the question, why do you all just take up a collection for the members on the first day of the week? Why don't you do it on Wednesday night or during a meeting or during some other time or have a car wash or a bake sale or well, the reason is because when you look in the New Testament, what you find is how the only way we know that a church ever raised funds was the voluntary offering of the members on the first day of the week. So we're trying to do it God's way. And that's why. But that's a powerful thing because when we treasure up our resources and they're used for God's work, we share in that work. That's the blessing. Verse 3. When I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, him will I send to bring your liberality to Jerusalem. This particular money was going to help poor saints in Jerusalem. Poverty stricken, terrible famine there. And he said, when, when that money is brought, it's your liberality, your work that you're sharing in because of your choice. I need to be a part of that blessing. I want to be a part of that blessing. 1 Timothy chapter 5 reminds us not every work is the church's work. Paul there writes, If any believing man or woman have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. Without getting too deep into the context, my simple point is, you know, not every work, not every good work is the church's work. God is specific about, through the examples of the New Testament, about the kind of work the early church did. But here's the point. Let its work be done. Let it not be burdened with other work, but let them do their work. And all of us share in that work. Another reason why I need to be a part of a local work is because I want to receive mutual and spiritual edification. Edification is just an old word for being built up, being strengthened. It's been said before that I think that the local church in some sense is a, is a greenhouse. You know what a greenhouse is? I, I, I can kill a cactus. I have no green thought. There are folks here who are really good at growing plants. And even a guy like me understands the value 
uh, of certain plants that just need protection and care and nurturing. And even when the elements outside can be difficult and harsh, we find a place where we can grow. Who can't relate to that? I'll tell you, that's what it is when we come together. You've got the world and all of its craziness and all of its ugliness, and then you find a place where people, with, with all their faults and with all of our, we're just trying to serve God and help each other get to heaven. Ain't it so? We were praying about that this morning, weren't we? We, we, we're, we're with people that want to be with God forever, who believe in heaven, who believe in hell, and the terror of it, and want to put that from us that we might concentrate on being with him, never turning from him. That, that's, that's a rare thing. Where else do you find that in the world? You might find one along and along, but, but to be with people who share that ambition, you can see God's wisdom. So he writes uh, in the letter we call Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Exactly. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. The value of assembling together, singing together, that's what the New Testament authorizes. They just came and sang. No performances. We're not here to say, boy, look at Wes, he's got a great voice. Or look at Wes, he sounds like a, a cat with his tail in the door. Whatever it might. That's not about me, is it? Hopefully or any other individual. It's, it's about mutual worship. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and sing and offer praise in your hearts to the Lord. And always, he says, for everything let your thanks be to God the Father, presented in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's that mutual edification He's not, we can sing individually, that's true. We may well do that. We may sing away as we t take some task on and think about spiritual things, and that's a good thing. But here he's talking about singing to one another, responding to one another, encouraging one another. That's what we do when we come together, and what a blessing it is. In uh, Acts chapter 20, we read about an occasion when Paul was in a hurry to get to Jerusalem but he stopped. And for a whole week, he waited for the first day of the week to come. Why? Because that was the day that the disciples came together to break bread. I don't think he's talking there about a common meal. I imagine they ate more than once, once a week. But he's talking about what just happened. The breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, as we call it. That was a special thing. And so on the first day of the week, that they shared in that together. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 described this same event when he wrote, is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread that we break a sharing in the body of Christ? The cup, the bread, a sharing with Christ. He says in verse 17, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body for we share in the one bread. It's not just that we are in communion with Christ, but in one sense with each other as we are in fellowship together and receiving that mutual edification as we take the supper together. Teaching, Acts chapter 20 and verse 26, Paul said these words to the elders of the church at Ephesus. And he said to them, as, Paul, as Luke records, Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel, all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. To feed, he says, the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. 
I want you to feed them. Feed them what? Not spaghetti. Feed them God's word. That's what will protect them from, he says, grievous wolves that will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away crooked things, false teaching that will draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. Paul said, my conscience is clean. I have told you the truth. I've laid out the whole counsel of God. You must feed the church likewise. He wraps, wraps it up by saying in verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. If we have speakers who are joke tellers or who are entertainers, you're not feeding people. But if we're here talking about serious things, if we're trying to understand and present and apply the word of God, that's what we need. And that's what you get from a local church that's doing what God would have us to do. And I think about, finally in this point, the warning that Paul gave to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3 when he said, I left you at Ephesus that, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Some have strayed from that doctrine. That's a point that I would make when it comes to joining ourselves to a local church. It's important to recognize not every place is committed to just preaching the New Testament doctrine, to the, the gospel of God. And learning the good lessons from the Old Testament that help us see and understand how important it is to serve Christ. There are many places where other doctrines are taught. And there are those who have strayed. And that's why you, as a Bible student, need to compare what you hear with what you read. Because I'm not the standard. The book is the standard. And if I stray from that, then you need to correct me on that matter. And if you have a group committed to doing something besides this book, they're not going to edify you. They're not going to be able to help. So it's an important decision to make. And as a wise fellow once said, sometimes the truth is, it's not always just what you hear at a place, sometimes it's what you don't hear that can let you know that there's a problem. Something else about joining, being a part of a local work, I need to offer service to the church. Phoebe was a lady who was described uh, in the book of Romans as a servant of the church at Sincrea. She wasn't just a servant of Christ, she was a servant of the church. I don't think that means she was a deacon in some formal sense because she couldn't meet the qualities of being a deacon. Not every person who is a servant is a deacon. Not all uh, have to be deacons to be servants. But I tell you, she was a servant of the church. And what Paul said was that if she asked something of you, give it to her because she's been a blessing to many. It reminds us in Philippians chapter 2 of another man named Epaphroditus. He was also a servant of the congregation at Philippi. He had gone all the way where Paul was in Rome and found him and ministered to him. Paul was there on trial for his life. But he had gotten so sick while he was over there, he almost died. And so Paul sends him back and he says, I'm not sending him back in disgrace, I'm sending him back in honor. Because he has served you well, he served me well, he served the Lord well. Honor people like him, since it was because of the work of Christ that he almost died. He risked his life. Local churches need people who are ready to serve. Serve God in the local church. I exhort, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. How do you do that? By giving the gifts that God has given you for his service. And he talks about that in this context here. And he describes a local body, I think, and he says, uh, we have uh, many members, just like a body does. And not all members have the same function. But every part of a body has a function and let it be about that function. And he goes through and describes different gifts that people may have. And some of them may be involved in, in uh, at that time, spiritual gifts, miraculous gifts. 
Some of them may have been in some other service. Some of them in teaching. Some of them in exhortation. Some of them in uh, contributing. Some of them in leading. Some of them in mercy. Whatever it is that you have an opportunity and the ability to do for God's service, let it be done. You know, I'm talking to these young folks here, these young Christians here. And I'm saying, if you're not thinking about what can I do? What's my place here? How can I find a way to serve? Well, God hasn't called you to be an elder today. That may be in the future. But I tell you, there's a lot of work to do. And I, I want to find my place. I want to find what I can do. And for those who are older here, we're not retired. Everybody has a role in a local church. Everybody doing what they can in order to help the whole. I need a place to serve, and the local church provides that. I need a spiritual family. You know, I think about that passage in 1 Corinthians 12 when Paul again compares the local church to a body. And he makes the point how that there's no division in the body. But the members have the same care one for another. And if one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. Well, of course they do. Because they're one body. If you have that kind of mentality in a local work, you're going to be guarded against so many problems. And the devil's going to have a hard time getting in there. I think about the old illustration of a, of a charcoal. We never had a gas grill when I was growing up. We had a charcoal grill. And you've seen this before. You take these charcoals and they teach you if you're going to make that fire, you're going to have to put these charcoals together and get them hot. And, and, and the reason for that is because it's a lot easier to get hot and stay hot if you're together than it is if you take these coals and separate them out. That's when they cool off quick. And I need that kind of togetherness to keep the zeal going, to keep me focused, to help me remember. It's a lot easier when we're isolated. That's one of the things that we struggle with. We got folks that maybe have health problems and they want to be here, they can't be here. I tell you, it's hard. It's hard when you don't have that togetherness. It's hard when you're hindered from being together. And any of us who've had that for any time knows exactly what that's about. I'll tell you something else I need. I need the mutual accountability that the local church provides. One of the problems is that here's a young person, they go off to school, and they don't join with the local church. And pretty soon they just wash out. Because they're down here maybe the first time they've been away from home and uh, pretty soon they get distracted and then, then they've just put aside what was important for other things. That can happen to people at any age. But if we're with folks that, that are on fire for God and they're watching out for us and we for them, there's a strength that's found in those numbers and an accountability that's found there as well. You know, the Lord was the one who, who told the story. If, if a brother sins against you, you go and you tell him his fault between you and him alone. This is a private matter. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. If he won't hear you, then take two or three more. That at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, then tell the church. Now we've, we've ramped up, we've gone from an individual to several to the church. And if he refuses to hear the church, then let that man be to you like a heathen man or a, a tax collector. Have no fellowship with him. He won't hear the church. Sometimes the church has to be involved in correcting behavior that's out of place. That's the Bible plan. As a last resort, but the church gives that context of accountability. That's a part of what, what I sign up for. When I say I want to be a part of this work, then what I'm saying is I want to be accountable to the discipline of this work. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, in a more positive way, he says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. I think he's talking here about local elders or shepherds. They watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for well, that is unprofitable for you, of course for them too, but for you. 
So here you have those who are members of a local work. By the way, if church membership is not a formal thing, how in the world do the elders know who to look over? Who is sheep are? Are these our sheep? Are they somebody else's sheep? Are they just wandering through the pasture? The shepherd knows, the shepherds know those who are their sheep under their, their watch. And they ought to know those who are their shepherds. It's a very formal arrangement in which people have a clear understanding of where they belong, to whom they answer, and to whom they are accountable. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a terrible situation there. Gross immorality in the church. Here's a man who had taken his father's wife. Horrible. And, and you are proud about that? What's there to be proud of? But notice what Paul said to do about that. He said, as though absent in the body, I'm present in spirit, I, I, I'm not there, but I know what you ought to do about that. Here's what you ought to do, verse 4. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, you deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I don't think that's some sort of uh, miracle curse. I think it's the idea, rather, of the church as it gathers together, acknowledging this who used to be one of ours now stands with the devil. His conduct is, is, is reprehensible. Make him ashamed of what he's done. But that's a part of that accountability. More could be said. We're short on time. Let me just close with this challenge to all of us, to me and to you as well. We're members of this church. Then how seriously do I take this membership? Just a few questions that, that we might offer. What if everybody attended the services the way I do? How would the church be affected? Would there be large periods where they don't have services because everybody attends just like I do? What, what if everybody prepared for Bible classes and attended Bible classes the way I do? What kind of Bible classes would we have? If everybody gave with the same generosity I do, what kind of work could be done? If everybody was as prepared to lead as I am, whether in the, in the service, worship, or some other, then what kind of leadership would we have? If everybody listened to the lessons the way I do, and everybody sang with the same kind of, of fervor and purpose as I do, what would the worship look like, sound like? What would be the result if everybody just followed my example what if everybody supported our gospel meetings as I do? Would we have any meetings? What if everybody prayed for the work with the same regularity that I do? Would God hear a petition for the work? What if every member was just like me? Would the work go down or up? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very blunt question. And it certainly strikes me. When I think about that, I think about ways that I surely need to get better. I, I hope that all of us we don't make the mistake of thinking about somebody else. I hope all of us take that question personally. Because I, I believe we can all agree local church membership ought not to be taken casually. It's a great privilege to be a member of a local church, but it's a great responsibility and one the Lord will hold us accountable for. Let me, let me behave uh, as if I, I know that and believe that to be true. I appreciate the kind way that you've listened this morning. Please get out your song books and turn to the number that's been selected. We invite you, if it be your desire today, to obey the gospel or maybe as one who is a child of God, if you need to make some correction, public correction, a public sin, Ask the brethren to pray for you. We'd be glad to assist you in, in any way that we can. Uh, let us know how we might help you now. As uh, we stand and sing at this time, would you please come?